What's up, everybody? We are in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Remembering that this is an epistle, a letter from Shaul of Tarsus, known as the Apostle Paul, even though there is zero goose egg historical evidence that he was ever named Paul or renamed to Paul. Anyway, Shaul of Tarsus. Uh, an emissary of Yeshua Messiah, according to the command of Elohim our Savior and the Master Yeshua Messiah, our expectation to Timothy, a genuine child, child in the belief. So this is an epistle from Shaul of Tarsus, Paul, to Timothy, for encouragement and instruction as Timothy steps out into the world to begin ministering on behalf of Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And I guess I just feel briefly that I should explain. Some people say Jesus. Some people say Yeshua. Some people say Yehoshua. Uh, some people say Yehoshua. Some people, whatever. Um, and they get really wrapped up in the name. I personally have cast out demons in the name of Jesus. They know who I'm talking about. I know who I'm talking about. And he knows who I'm talking about. That being said, there never lived a man named Jesus the Christ. Jesus is an anglicization of the Greco-Roman Iesus, which was a translation from Yeshua or Yahushua. He was a Hebrew man. There's no J in Hebrew. Okay, It was a Y, Yeshua. Uh, or Joshua, same name, which means salvation, literally salvation, interestingly. What a coincidence, right? And so over time, it went from Yeshua or Yehoshua to Iesus, which then got anglicized, Englishized, if you will, to Jesus. And Christ means the anointed of Yahuwah or Elohim, the chosen of God. And so his title is Mashiach, Christ the anointed. His name is Yeshua or Yehoshua. But it's okay. If you call him Jesus Christ, I'll make no bones about it. Praise Yah that you know him. Um, and so no need to make bones about me saying Yeshua because I feel as if he has said to me, hey, it's almost like you knew a guy named James for a long time and one day he goes, hey, you know what? Call me Jim. We're at that level of our relationship now. And I felt as my relationship with Messiah has progressed to this point, he has said to me, call me Yeshua. Yes, sir. Copy that. Thank you for the privilege. So, Shaul is writing to Timothy, Timotheos, a genuine child in the belief of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. And he's giving him instruction for how to in this particular instance, set up the governance of the early assemblies. So, if we start in chapter 2 then, as we've already read chapter 1 last week, go back and read that if you haven't seen it. First of all then, I urge the petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all men, for kings and all those who are in authority, in order that we lead a calm and peaceable life in all reverence and seriousness. Pray for everybody, always, including your leadership. This is For this is good and acceptable before Elohim, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Meaning that we should pray for people that don't even believe so that they come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one Elohim and one mediator between Elohim and men, the man, Mashiach, Yeshua. It's interesting, I can see a lot of people getting ready to throw a punch or start an argument over that phrase, the man, the man, Mashiach, Yeshua. What's well, capital M, man? He was the Lord our God, Yahuwah our Elohim made flesh. And dare I say, wherever we see man, wherever we see man interacting 
with the physicality of Yah, the Creator. I believe that to be Messiah. When Melchizedek comes out of Mount Salem and blesses Abram and blesses him with the Word. What Word is that? In the beginning was the Word and the Word was made flesh. I come not to destroy the Torah or the prophets but to complete it. The Greek word complete is plerau, to embody it. The embodiment of that Word. Melchizedek was Yeshua. We see this in the Hebrews, uh, that the high priest is Yeshua in the order of Melchizedek. Same role he's played before. Right When uh, Jacob wrestles with God, with Yahuwah, to the break of day, and then he's blessed. He's blessed by who? God made flesh, Yeshua. We see Yeshua appear over and over again. And so in this form, when Yahuwah takes flesh to interface with his people, we have the man, capital M, Mashiach, Yeshua. Verse 6, who gave himself a ransom for all to be witnessed in its own seasons, for which I was appointed, Shaul, a proclaimer and an emissary, I am speaking the truth in Messiah and not lying, a teacher of the nations in belief and truth. That in truth part is very important. Uh, Messiah himself in Matthew 24 says, Many shall come in my name. See that you are not deceived. And we'll see later on in chapter 3, Shaul says, Holding the secret of the belief with a clean conscience. Be not deceived. Many shall come in my name. And many have. The appropriation of the title Christian throughout, what, 38,000 different denominations uh, has been so egregious to the point where it's used as an argument for atheism where folks will say, see, even the Christians don't know. That's what Shaul is saying here. Even the Christians don't know. Um, and we'll reference Acts, the book of Acts, here in a moment in regard to that. A teacher of the nations in belief, we must believe with our hearts that Yeshua is Mashiach and we have to walk in his ways and in truth as we walk in those ways that we don't stray from that narrow path. That we follow the teachings of Mashiach, of Messiah, of Jesus, not the teachings of men. That is why Yeshua railed against the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and the high priests because they had made a religion out of his Father's commands. And as we see today, many men who refer to themselves as pastors and leaders and rabbis and bishops and deacons and whatever, priests, have made a religion out of the commands of Messiah. And in many cases, wholeheartedly ignored the commands of Yah. And Yah, Father God, gave Yeshua the commands that he taught. Yeshua himself says, my doctrine is not my own. I give you no new word, but the word that you've had from the beginning. I and my Father am one. If you love me, keep my commands. Guard my Father's commands as I have guarded them. Interesting. Verse 8, so I resolve that men pray everywhere, lifting up hands that are set apart without wrath and disputing. Men pray everywhere. Lift those hands up without wrath. Don't be pissed off and don't be arguing. Pray together. Pray for each other. Pray as a body of Christ. Likewise, that women dress themselves becomingly with decency and sensibleness, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather with good works, which is becoming for women undertaking worship of Elohim. So rather than be ornamented by the world, showing off your cash and prizes, show off your good works. Show off your belief in Elohim. You know, this is something I personally have struggled with. Women, don't put your bodies on display. That is for your husband. There's a time for that. It's not for me. It's not for anybody else. It's not for somebody in line at the grocery store or at the gym. We're at church. That is, and the two shall become one flesh. 
there's one man on the face of the earth who is to see you and look at you that way. That's your husband. It's not anybody else. And I'm telling you, the Zitzi over the tassels, numbers 1537, have been a lifesaver to me on multiple occasions where I have literally had to grab my tassels and look away and think to myself, how could somebody walk out of their house and think that that is an acceptable bit of clothing to put on? I could see every curve of your body. And some could make the argument, well, you're telling me as a woman that I'm not allowed to put my body on display? I'm telling you what the Bible says where it says, yeah, don't do that with decency and sensibleness. Not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly garments, but with good works, which is becoming for women undertaking worship of Elohim. Prudence is good. There's also, I'll tell you as a man, when a man looks upon a woman who is putting every curve she has on display out there in the world, the thought process that occurs is not that this is a woman who values herself. It's that this is a woman who is trying to attract a mate, who is interested in only one thing. And so, just a word of wisdom from me to you in my personal experience. Let a woman learn in silence in all subjection but I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, rather to be in silence. Again, we're talking about church governance here. Because Adam was formed first, and then Hava, and then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman, having been deceived, fell into transgression. But she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in belief, and love, and set apartness holiness, and sensibleness. Now, in the modern church, you'll find, in many cases, women pastors, female pastors. And I've had many people say, well, yeah, you know, we're more into the Pauline doctrine. Okay, Pastor Eileen, have you read 1 Timothy 2? Because that's not what this says. To say nothing of, what is it, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 13? Where are you, my Corinthians? Romans, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 13. Has Messiah been divided? Was Shaul, was Paul impaled for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Shaul? But Paul said, has Messiah been divided? Was Shaul impaled for you? Or were you immersed in the name of Shaul? I thank Elohim that I immersed not one of you, except Crispus and Gaios, that no one should say I baptized them in my own name. Which is not to say it doesn't matter what Paul says, but it is to say it matters much more what Yeshua said. So if we're going to make the Pauline doctrine argument, let's go to 1 Corinthians 1.13 and read that part where he unequivocally states there is one Mashiach, there is one body of Christ. And so here in 1 Timothy 2, Shaul again is giving Timothy advice, practical, tactical knowledge on how to set up the governance of the church. And that includes let a woman learn in silence in all subjection. Women to be are to be subjected to their husbands as that husband is in subjection uh, to Christ, to Mashiach. So the order here is, it doesn't say women don't attend church. This is an onus on the men to teach your wife. Receive the teaching that's in the word that's presented to you in the assembly. And then make sure your wife understands that. But I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, rather to be in silence. Because Adam was formed first, then Hava. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman, having been deceived, fell into transgression. But she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in belief and love, and set apartness with sensibleness. And in the assembly, it's not the woman's place to bring the word or to teach. At home with your children, is it is absolutely a part of how you're supposed to raise your children. Raise them up in the way that they should go, so that you do not depart from it when they are older. Also understanding that the head of that household is the husband. 
there's an order to this. It's Yah, then the husband, then the wife. And the reason for that is that the husband is under the covering of Yah, and the wife is under the covering of the husband. Now, if either of those things get out of balance, it's bad news. If the husband is not walking in ways appropriate to be under the covering of Yah, there's going to be dissonance. If the wife is not walking in ways to be under the covering of the husband, there's going to be dissonance. Chapter 3. Trustworthy is the word. I know, it sounds archaic, doesn't it? That's positive. There are people out there right now writing angry messages on YouTube. Well, yeah, but what about... I'm reading to you from the New Testament. And I'm about tired of people saying, well, I, yeah, you know, Bear, you're into all that Old Testament stuff. No, this is the New Testament, bro. The renewed covenant, the Brit Hadashah, the new cut, the new blood. Don't cherry pick. Just because something uh, creates cognitive dissonance for you, which feels uncomfortable, doesn't mean you get to just throw it by the wayside and cast it away and have some type of a la carte faith. Hold on to the things that feel good to you and chuck the rest. If you do that, you are putting yourself above Elohim. You are now immediately outside of that order that I just discussed. You're not under his covering anymore. You're trying to cover him. It doesn't work that way. He created the heavens and the earth. He knows every hair on your head. He knew you before you were formed in the womb. And you would dare approach his word in that way. And then again wonder why you don't feel the blessings of your creator. Because you've supplanted his teachings with your own. Because it's uncomfortable. You're not guaranteed comfort by your belief in Mashiach. And people conflate easy and good. They think that because something's comfortable or easy that it must be good. No, that's the way of the enemy. It's luring you into a trap. Easy and good are not the same thing. So you can and should believe the entirety of this word or none at all. Chapter 3. Trustworthy is the word. See that? Trustworthy is the word. If a man longs for the position of an overseer, he desires a good work. An overseer, or a bishop, as it is also known and translated, or a pastor, or a rabbi, or a whatever. Pick your poison. An overseer then should be blameless. The husband of one wife, sober, sensible, orderly, kind to strangers, able to teach, not given to wine, no brawler, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and no lover of silver. One who rules his own house well, having his children in subjection with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how shall he look after the assembly of Elohim? I have that underlined in my word. Also where it says a husband of one wife. I've heard it said, and I think it's accurate, a husband of a wife. And the reason for this is if somebody is to minister to an assembly of Elohim, yet they don't have a wife, how are they supposed to be able to offer a word of wisdom on marital relations and the, the dichotomy of marriage, the push-pull of man and wife and the union that that creates, again getting back to that covering and the order that's presented there, well if you don't have any real practical tactical experience in that, how are you supposed to offer any input on the subject? There's also a, and this is not the only value to a wife by far, but men have physical needs. and. If you don't have a wife as a leader of an assembly of Elohim, there is no righteous way to address those physical needs. We see this in the scandals in the Catholic Church. We see this with the whoring within the Christian Church. There's an order to this. The Father divinely inspired every word in this book. And we can either accept that and walk within it and be blessed because of it, or we can step outside of that and not accept it and have the opposite of blessings, also known as curses. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how shall he look after the assembly of Elohim? 
not a new convert, lest he become puffed up with pride and fall into judgment of the devil. And he should even have a good witness from those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. A man of renown, upstanding, righteous, moral, ethical, and not just a new believer. Somebody who's been in the game for a while, has a little bit of experience. Likewise, attendants are to be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for filthy gain, holding to the secret of the belief with a clean conscience. And so where it says attendants and other translations, it has the word deacons. And so if we look in the scriptures where it says attendants, it can almost sound like those who are attending the assembly, like the congregants, the members of the assembly. Rather, the intonation here is those who are attending to the administration of the assembly. Those who are attending to the people. Deacons, ushers, associate pastors, whatever label you want to put on that. Because remember, we're dealing with church governance here. And so for those who are attending to the assembly, they are to be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to too much wine, not greedy for filthy gain, holding to the secret of the belief with a clean conscience. And so I mentioned earlier, we talked about Acts 20 real quick. And so if we look at Acts chapter 20, Acts 20, there we go, 28 through 31. Shaul of Tarsus again speaking, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the set-apart spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd or pastor the assembly of Elohim, which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure savage wolves shall come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves men shall arise, speaking distorted teachings to draw away the taught ones after themselves. Therefore, watch, remembering that for three years, night and day, I did not cease to warn each one with tears. And now, brothers, I commit you to Elohim and to the word of his favor, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those having been set apart. And so, Shaul here is saying, hey, you've been established as a shepherd or an overseer by the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, the set apart spirit over the assembly of Elohim, which he bought and paid for with his own blood. But be careful, because this flock that you're shepherding, wolves will come in and ravage it. There will be men speaking distorted teachings to draw away the taught ones, the members of the assembly, after themselves. So the secret of the belief with a clean conscience here is saying, hold fast to what you know to be true through Messiah. Don't be tossed like a ship upon the waves by every new teaching of man. Those men, many of them, may claim the name of Elohim, may claim the name of Jesus, of Yahuwah, of Yeshua HaMashiach. They don't know Him. Don't let them be attendants to the assembly. And don't let them destroy your assembly. And so back to the attendants, those serving the congregation, and let these also, chapter, verse 10 rather, 310, let these also be proved first, then let them serve, if they are unreprovable. Don't just put them in, to slot them into a position of power. Prove them. That means like to try them, to test them. Make sure that they have a heart after Yah. Then let them serve, if they are unreprovable. Wives in the same way, reverent, not false accusers, sober, trustworthy in every way. Let attendants be the husbands of only one wife, ruling children and their own houses well. Disorder. How can you bring strength to the assembly if your house is out of order? You can't. It starts first between you and Yah. It comes from Yah to you. It goes from you to your wife you and your wife to your children, and then out from your household into the assembly, that strength and that reverence of Yah goes out and allows the assembly to be strong because of it. Otherwise, if you're in a position of strength, or a position of authority rather, but you're not strong, you're dragging the assembly down. Your bullcrap is affecting everybody else. 
For those who have served well as attendants gain good standing for themselves and much boldness in the belief that is in Messiah Yeshua. I am writing you this, expecting to come to you shortly, but, if I delay, that you might know how you should behave in the house of Elohim, which is the assembly of the living Elohim, a strong support and the foundation of truth. So I've been meaning to come and tell you this personally, comma, I may not get there and you need to know this. Which is why I'm writing you this, so that y'all know how to behave yourselves in the assembly, the house of Elohim. How to conduct yourselves. And beyond all question, the secret of reverence is great, who was revealed in the flesh, declared right in spirit, was seen by messengers, was proclaimed among nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in esteem. reference to Yeshua there. So, church governance from the mouth of Shaul. And as I said earlier, we can see many examples within the Big C Christian Church where even those who espouse to believe the Pauline doctrine under the renewed covenant of the New Testament will cherry pick whatever they want uh, to come up with their own doctrines and dogmas of men, which we call religion. And so there is a clear delineation between spirituality and religion. There's a clear delineation between reading the book and doing what it says, following Messiah, and religion. And so, as always, I would encourage you to read your own word, do what it says, and serve Yah by the grace of Yeshua first and foremost, and be not concerned with what any man, myself included, would have to say with you, say to you, but be concerned about what did Yeshua say? What did Yah command you to do? What promises of inheritance do you have through your obedience? That's what I think we should be concerned with. Not the doctrines and dogmas of men. Bless y'all. Shalom.